<laughs> All right, folks, this has been Written on the Edge. The Rope Podcast is produced jointly by Rogue Ravens Media and Aquagon Media. And no, it's not anymore. I'm going to redo that. <laughs> <laughs> I think Baz just found our blooper. Uh-huh. <sighs> you left the station on. Mm-hmm. And she used to leave Telemundo on. And my parrot started copying a lot of stuff. <laughs> Because they say it so emphatically. Yes. You know? right, With right, a lot of right. screaming. Even now, sometimes you just walk through the house and she screams and you're like, she's like, who is that? And I'm like, the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, it was the television. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. I'm going to read back some things you guys said that would make a great title. If you hear one you like, just kind of let me know. I'll put a star by it and we'll pick from the starred ones at the end. So starting from just chronologically. My mom read to me in the womb. So then it happened. You described the door. Who doesn't love that? Internal joke. Your hormones are ablaze. (laughs) I'll star that one. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Getting a second chance. Not being the default. So I can just finish my tea. (laughs) Worthy of a sheet protector. (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Come on, let's go. And that was pretty skippy. <laughs> oh, <B. laughs> I like that one. All right. That was pretty skippy. <laughs> so, I like that one too. The skippy? Yeah. Yes. All yes. Right, I was going to say, I'll, if you want, I can read the three contenders again. <laughs> your, right. your hormones are ablaze, worthy of a sheet protector, or that was pretty skippy. Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. I kind of like worthy of a sheet protector <laughs> just worthy because of- if you don't know what a sheet protector is, you might be like, right. What, <laughs> what are they talking and about? And even if you do, like what kind of sheet <laughs> yeah, are we like, protecting? Yeah, what that right? Yeah. 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 Is that a euphemism? What's happening? Yeah. What's up? Is that, yeah. Is that a euphemism worthy of a sheet protector? Right, right, right. <laughs> okay. And with queer people, it's totally apt. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, then. And you're still recording? Yeah, go ahead. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 22, Worthy of a Sheet Protector. podcast. I'm Ben Sebastian here with my co-host, S.A. Baz Collins. Hey! And we're really glad you're here with us. We have three guests today. Brenda Murphy writes erotic romance. You can catch her musings on writing books and living with wicked ADHD on her blog, Writing While Distracted. She loves sideshows and tattoos, and yes, those are her monkeys. When she's not loitering at her local library, she wrangles twins, one dog, and an unrepentant parrot. Brenda, welcome back to the show. Uh, Nice to be back. Woo. Also joining us, we have Megan Hart. She writes books. Some of them use bad words, but most of the other words are okay. Some of them hit bestseller lists and win awards, and some don't, but that's the way it goes. She can't live without music, the internet, or the ocean, but she and Soda have achieved an amicable cu- uncoupling. She loathes the feeling of corduroy or velvet, and modern art leaves her cold. She writes a little bit of everything from horror to romance, though she's best known for writing steamy fiction that sometimes makes you cry. Megan, welcome back to the show. Thanks. It's good to be here. (laughs) And introducing Fiona Zetti. She was born under the Jamaican sun, but now makes her home in Spain. Since getting the writing bug, she's published around 30 books and short stories, mostly about Black queer romance. At this very second, she's probably writing another book, and it has 100% chance of having a queer romance and queer women in it. Her her pseudo-healthy obsessions are French pastries, English cars, and Jamaican food. Fiona, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Round of applause. Round of applause. It's our pleasure. <laughs> so 
I'm going to ask each of you just to give us a really quick, like one or two minute, how you became a writer, and then we'll go into how you came together to write this project. So Fiona, actually, I'm going to start with you. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I always have a, this horror of being first, but thank you so much for bringing my nightmare to life. Um, my pleasure. How, <laughs> how did I, I don't know. I think it just sort of happened. Like I've always loved reading. Um, my mom read to me in the womb. And so after I came out, <laughs> I started reading my own <laughs> stories <laughs> right away, eyes open, um, right, reading. And then I wanted to write those stories. And so I didn't know, I'm not aware of any time where I didn't want to create my own stories. And so it just happened. And the first chance I got to write something and I and won a contest was in high school and it was addictive. And it's been happening ever since, writing winning awards, winning, not winning awards, as Megan's bio says, and, you know, just carrying on and really enjoying it. That's awesome. Megan? I, I also have always loved Write stories the words. and writing. And <laughs> <laughs> I know all the big Lee words. <laughs> um, what was the question? <laughs> just real quick how you became an author. I, um, I can remember writing stories as far back as uh, I don't know, like kindergarten. As soon as I could write something, I started writing stories. And when I was in sixth grade, I I had this epiphany that people did this for a, a living, like this was their job. They wrote books, and that just seemed really cool. And I just decided I want to write stories and be an author. And then I just wrote some stories and became an author. Perfect. <laughs> so simple. Brenda. <laughs> Hi, Brenda. Oh, man. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that storyteller um, part of all of us is is consistent because I would, even if I didn't write them down, make up stories in my head about people I saw on the street or just around or little snippets of conversation just to entertain myself, um, mostly. Uh, and then, yeah, I was probably seventh grade. I think I wrote, um, we had like some, I had a really great English teacher in seventh grade. And I got to do some really fun creative writing projects. And that kind of lit the fire, but I, um, I came from a generation where you went to college so you could get a good job and make money. Um, and that, now that, so that part kind of just got shoved to the side until my kids were like two and I was home with them. And it is incredibly stressful to be home with twins. Um, and it also, I just needed an outlet for, for myself, you know, and I love to read and I love to write. And that's when I really started applying myself um, to get writing the stories down, not just holding them in my head, but getting them out there. And I think that that's the, the consistent thing. Like you have them, you just want to tell them, share them with people. So that's, and then um, I get, yeah, that's just how it went. Like, so they're 11 now and I've been writing and having stuff published probably since I think were like three or four and it just went, it just went. I don't know how else wow. <laughs> it just happened. <laughs> I, I was, I swear I wasn't on fire when I got on the bridge, but now it is. And so here we go. <laughs> Excellent. Oh my God. They're so old now. Wow. They are. They are. It's unbelievable. You would not, they're, uh, they're, yeah. Rose is just up underneath of my chin and uh, he's a little bit shorter now, but they're going to pass me. They're going to be way taller than I am. Wow. That's crazy. That is crazy. I love it. <clears throat> So the three of you came together to write Love, Blood, and Sanctuary, which will come out on the day this episode airs. Yeah. So yeah. I want to hear how you came together to write it, and then I'll ask you each about your contributions. <laughs> so whose so, brainchild was this? Do you remember? How did we? Did we, <laughs> we do you remember when I did a show with you guys last year? And I don't even remember what book it was for. And you asked me if I could write a book with anybody. And I yeah. said, well, I had just gotten to do that with Megan. And I said, but if I could really write with anybody else that was around living. And I said, I'd like to write a book with Megan and Fiona, having not talked to either one of them together <laughs> or separately about this idea at all. So then as soon as I get off the podcast, I'm like, damn, I better like maybe sort of say that because I think I ended up <laughs> like, I'm totally serious if you guys are listening to this. So then it happened. So, <laughs> so it's, it's all your fault. It's all my fault. Uh, it, it's all you, my fault. You know, you have to manifest it in the universe and the universe just <laughs> happened right. to be listening. Oh, Brenda. Won oh, okay. <laughs> right? Get on that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what your schedules are like, but let's do a book together. Right, 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 right. right, right. <laughs> I don't even remember 
you asking, I just remember it happening. I, I think I messaged you and I said, hey, do you want, I, this is, I think I just messaged you and said, hey, do you want to do like what we did together yes. with Fiona? And you said, yeah, sure. And so I like messaged Fiona. I said, hey, do you want to do like a, you know, anthology thing with Megan and I? And I'm like, yeah, okay. So that's how it happened. Basically. And then, yeah, yeah pretty much. All right. So <laughs> your stories are all tied together by a supernatural nightclub. Is that it? Yeah, that was Fiona's idea. The supernatural nightclub was it? Nightclub, right? Yeah, it was nightclub, <laughs> restaurant, bar, Happy all shop. In one, bistro, <laughs> all in one thing where you could go to get what you needed at any time. I think right. they're, they're planning rooms. an expansion mall later, but. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it's funny that you actually describe it that way because where I live in Madison, we had something like that back in the 80s and 90s called Hotel Washington. It had two nightclubs, it had a cafe, it had an oh. underground bar that you I was gonna say you had a supernatural night. <laughs> yeah, we did. Oh totally. Wow. <laughs> I was the resident wizard. <laughs> so all right. So Fiona, you he says of, with the flamingo staff in the background. Yeah, right. <laughs> My flamingo walking stick, folks. Don't question it. <laughs> um, so Fiona you said or you looked a little shocked when they reminded you this was your idea yeah because I, I I am shocked was shocked because I just remember us <laughs> getting on this conference call this like all of us just talking about different things and like ideas flying and I was like yes yes that makes sense perfect let's go and then that was it it just felt like a nice symmetry and I don't remember that being my idea, but whatever, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. I have the notes somewhere in a day book because I scrawl things down um, because of a brain like a sieve, mm -hmm. um, especially with the kids and my distraction issues. But I know if I go back it notes somewhere, I've got like nightclub. We hadn't decided on a name for it yet, but we, but you described the door in the phone call. And I actually have your description yeah. written down. Mm -hmm. from the phone call that that you had described the door the vision that you had for this door and this nightclub oh, yes yeah, so I remember that too I <laughs> also remember it that way <laughs> me, me, me no but okay <laughs> I also have a memory that doesn't function half the time so <laughs> is the, there you go is the door like a, a portal or some sort of liminal space that transports you a little bit off earth how, how what's the significance of the door hmm so I think Hmm. Fiona. <laughs> as far as the door goes it's Fiona's I mean, alter ego of flipping houses <laughs> like, whose idea was this <laughs> I think we had to all agree like what the door looked like so we could all um you know have it in our books in a very accurate way because once you get behind the door you go to wherever you need to go whether it's the coffee shop or the bar or the the place for intimacy or yes. wherever. So, <laughs> so not everyone, not everyone in the story in each story goes to the same place. And okay. so we had to agree at least on, on one commonality besides, you know, the, the name of it. Like, so this amazing door, and then you go into the space that looks really small from the outside, but when you go in, it's just endless. Okay. So, so is it, is it, um, that, sorry, Vance, is, is it that the, um, anybody can walk through the door or is it like sort of like harry potter where only certain beings can do that yeah so it's a, it's a space for magical beings megan take it away yes <laughs> um <clears throat> the handoff of the century just happened ladies and gentlemen so, <laughs> and nbs alike <laughs> i think um i think the way we described it was non-supernatural beings can see that there's a door there, but they just don't think anything of it. It's just, ah. it's it's not that they can't see it at all. It's just, they don't see it. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, 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 but yeah. if you are able to go in, then you know it's there and then you can see it and go in. Yeah. But it's and you just can go in if you're thing. escorted by a paranormal person. Okay. So, yes. you know, they may bring their, their human escorts in, but they don't always know. The humans aren't aware of the magical space and the presence. And that's, you know, that's kind of low key. I think I have my um, bartender telling the the bar back to, you know, pay attention to what's going on because humans don't always realize that they've entered a magical space and things could happen. So, yeah. All right. So let's jump yeah. into your individual stories. Who's this first in the book? Oh my God, I think mine. I think okay. mine. Mine, I yes, think, first I think no. mine's first. Everybody yeah. quickly opens <laughs> up their ARC. <laughs> <laughs> mine? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. 
So um, Brenda, tell us what yeah. you can about your contribution without being spoilery. Yeah, no. So Sanguine Faith, um, I think all of us, when we, the other thing we talked about is we kind of, not that we don't love vampires, but we wanted to move away from that, um, from that idea of a supernatural being and maybe bring in non-Western ideas mm -hmm. and traditions and um, histories and myths into our stories. Because as much as we love vampires, and we all do, um, we wanted to do something a little different. So my story is based a lot on Egyptian blood magic and Wallace Budge's um, book, uh, which I hope I'm saying his last name right, who knows? I'm sure there's some Egyptologist out there that just cringed. But anyway. Um, they're not here. Uh, yeah, they're not here. We'll just go with it. Um, I love that yeah. you think that they're listening to us. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I you just never love that. Know. You never know. <laughs> Crazy people do for a living that also well, that's true. That's read true. books, right? And they'll let you know. But um, so I drew from that Egyptian. Um, there's a lot of resurrection rituals tied into the pyramids and death rituals and the magic rituals. Um, and the one that really attracted me was there was a resurrection spell that is supposed to bring that person back to life, but that person's enemies become your enemies. So you're they're basically oh. raising an army of the dead, right? Who doesn't love that? Um, right. So we kind of like, you know- it's on, my, it's on my bucket list. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's what I went with. So, um, you know, this uh, uh, very um, kind of down on her luck, uh, being who's a supernatural and human combination. She is a, a halfling sort of a being. Um, ends up in this townhouse. And when I was imagining this story, because I tend to use movies as kind of like my touchstones where the feel of a movie, not necessarily copying it, but the feel of it. And this is somewhere between the ghost and Mrs. Muir without the misogynistic crap um, and, uh, and Hellraiser. So, so that's well, just, there's I mean, a pairing I didn't see coming. Right. <laughs> Right, because I love the I love Hellraiser. It's like one of my favorite movies of all time. It's just so campy mm -hmm. and so absolutely ridiculous. And I love the written story as well. So, yeah, all I of just that. Thought, that whole when you said that, I got the whole RCA Victor dog. I know I'm dating myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of those mashups in my head, which always make sense in my head and never really make that much sense when I explain them. Although some people get it, so we're like, yeah, yeah, okay, I got it. So, but it's entertaining so it is yeah. there you it go is, it is entertaining. There you go. so that's so that's my story so um and you're laurel, sticking to it yeah laurel meets this entity in the house and they go from there and there's a lot of uh yeah, a lot of family stuff because she's got a lot of pressures to deal become what the family wants her to become and embrace her magical side and she's like backing away from that um and her creepy uncle and you know it was fun so that's kind of that's kind of where we're at. So it's a friends to lovers uh, revenge story of the sorts. Nice. So it's like the Brady Bunch vacation thing. Mm, sort of. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Call it the Brady Bunch. More like I'm trying to think of like uh, something that's a little bit more <clears throat> dark. <laughs> and that, I don't know. You know, sometimes Alice. Just <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So who's was second? I think mine is second. Do you want to, you want to go? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really base mine on any existing mythology that I can think of, but I was just really fascinated with the idea of like being able to, uh, so my character, the, one of my main characters is a hemomancer. And I thought I had made that up, but it turns out somebody else already made up hemomancer. But the idea that you could use blood to tell the future and what that would mean for the person who who does it but also who whose future you're telling like how do you get the blood and what do you do with it and right and so if if you are someone who can read the future in blood what happens when there's somebody who's a blood demon <laughs> like someone who's created from blood basically or or like infests someone else's blood mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so I just kind of went with it and just made something up. I think I made it up probably again. It's not somebody else probably thought of it first <laughs> and I got it wrong, but, um, I just, I really like the idea of, uh, someone who's, 
whose job is trying to tell other people what their futures are and that the future is not set in stone and that you have the opportunity, like once you learn what your future is or, or how it's seen, you can still make changes. You have the opportunity to change your life. It's not just fate. You know, if you are told something's going to happen, you can choose to follow that path or you can find a different one. Nice. So I really liked that idea for the main character Hadassah and then, uh, and just, and what does that mean for her? Could she read her own future? Could she, you know, could she make the changes that she needs to in order to find love? And so that's what my story is about. Nice. No, <laughs> I have to ask, because just because it's in the last line of your bio, did you make somebody cry? With this story? Um, I mean, it made me cry in the because story. it was so, it was hard to write. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like, uh, we had set a deadline and then I was like, guys, I, I'm not going to make the deadline. <laughs> it's a, it was a, it, I felt like it took me a while to really get into writing the story. And then, but once I did, I just, I loved it. And, uh, and it, it all happened very quickly once I found exactly what I was trying to go for. Mm -hmm. So I cried a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> did it pull on some personal strings? Not so much that, just that it was, so, you know, I don't know if anybody else feels this way as a writer, but, but it's hard. Writing is hard. Mm -hmm. it is. And sometimes you have this great idea and you think, I'm just going to sit down and the words are going to come out. And it's going to be great. And I'm going to get on the page or on the computer monitor exactly what I'm trying to get across and how I feel. And it just won't happen. doesn't matter. You can rewrite Your it. Your muse is off. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what subplot were you going for? Forget that. Or, you know, right. what emotional strings are you pulling on yourself to get this right, on the page? Right. And mm -hmm. so um, it wasn't that the, the story or what happens in the story touched my, my personal emotions as much as it really got into why are you, what makes you think you can even write this? Oh, why do you demon. think you're even a writer? That'll yeah. Do. That was my blood demon. Right. Why are you, what just go, stop do something else you're not good at this mm. well oh. we did write this in the midst of the world <laughs> burning true yeah it was, it was very true. for all of us and that's why we um we pushed it back because things were just crazy and um i think that that we were all it was like uh, molasses i mean normally i you know prior to the world catching fire you know i'd sit down and knock out between a thousand and two thousand words in a couple of hours Mm -hmm. You know, with this story um, and with all of us, we all talked about how it was like pulling teeth. Like it just <laughs> took forever. And I was like, I know the words are in there to forever, get them out. Yeah. Right. It was for just hard. It was hard. It was hard for me to write because I, I had a lot of why. Okay. Is this even going to matter in a few months? Yeah. You know? Right. So well, I'm, I'm glad you pushed through because it looks like a great <laughs> book. I mean, for real. It's an awesome too. story. <laughs> it is an awesome story. It's a totally awesome story. It's like Megan, Fiona and I finished ours. And then Megan sent hers to us. And we're like, dang, she makes it look so easy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and she wrote it in like five minutes, right? Right. We're like, oh. right? I finished my and you have your Zoom, here. then you have your Zoom call and she's got hair missing. You know, she's got the Alice Cooper eyes. <laughs> I, I was definitely the slow poke with it. And it was just, it just wouldn't, it just wouldn't come out. I just couldn't find it. And then, but when, then I, when I did and, uh, and it, it blew out. our minds basically. Right. Like you, right. Like like, you do. You do that. Right. Right. We're like, dang, how did she do that? <laughs> <laughs> so Fiona, what, what about yours? Tell yep. us a little bit about how yours worked. Well, what's my, <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, internal joke so um you had to be there <laughs> you had to be there because I was gonna say that you know when I read Megan's story I was like oh I should just put mine in the in the fire because that was just so good <laughs> I would never finish mine if you guys hadn't done yours and then I was like oh yay oh yay, <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> so yeah I was happy to happy to read it but okay so my story is about um the Orisha gods 
Um, I've always been sort of been very fascinated by them. And these are the gods from um, different parts of Africa. And so um, I, oh, I hear a noise. And um, I wanted to make something, again, like nothing Western, and, but also something that would resonate. Uh, so my story is about family, it's about coming out, it's about second chance romance, and it's about you know when you meet someone and you're totally infatuated, like on, on sight. It's not quite love at first sight, but it's like that sort of, your hormones are just like ablaze and you connect and it's just wild fire. That kind of thing happens when you're in your, in your 20s mostly. Sometimes That's when it. I say it that the whore <laughs> is moaning. <laughs> Your inner whore is moaning. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that, that, that yeah. Hmm. Box. So yeah, so that was basically it. like nothing, nothing like super wild and profound, but yeah, I just love romance in general. And I, I always like the idea of getting a second chance to get something that had gone wrong to get it right. So that's essentially what it is with a, um, a blood god around to make things a little bit spicy and different. I don't know what, if I can say anything else without giving spoilers. So I'm, I'll leave it at that. That's fair. So I, There's sex? It, it mm -hmm. was so, well, <laughs> as, as, want, as want to ha happen, you know. Um, but it, did, did you guys all decide that blood was the thread? Yes. Yeah. Yes. This? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was a that was the big like we sat down to figure out the thread. So the the door, the sanctuary club, the blood, and I think we pretty much left it at that. Like everybody kind of went off on their own. Yeah, we were like not vampire, but blood. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, at the end, yeah, I think they they all for us working independently work really well together and. You know, once you send stuff in and you send it off to the editor and then, I don't know, I second guess myself all the time, but I sat down when the ARCs came, when the advanced copies came and I read it straight through and I'm like, okay, these all work. They all work together and they all work with each other. And you don't feel like sometimes you'll read an anthology and things are jarring as you move from one story to the next. And these just flowed. I mean, they just were, they worked well together, which is um, pretty cool. Especially so, because, we, uh, go ahead, go ahead. oh, I was going to say, so we all agreed on the, on the basics of Sanctuary, the, the club, coffee bar, hotel room, office space, whatever. <laughs> room but, of requirement. <laughs> but we did not, um, we didn't talk about it when we were writing our stories about the descriptions or exactly what was in there or whatever, because the idea is that, as Fiona said, when you, when you go in there, you go to where you need to go. And so, especially because we did not test that against each other's stories but they all it you don't read any one of them and say oh well in this other story it said that there was a you know the bar was this and that doesn't make any sense and I think we all it all just they all just flow together that's Excellent. harmony I love Later. that yep. Later. yep yep so did how how did the the writing process go I mean you guys said you read each other so did any of you kind of feel inspired a bit by what the other one was doing or was it really you finished each one and then you read them together or how did it work? I think we just sent them to each other as we finished. I, I was worried um, I was worried for myself because I had gotten a criticism from another novella that I wrote that I had too abrupt an ending. So I was really concerned with pacing. So I think I sent it to both you guys to ask about whether or not this feels like I just, what did you say, Fiona? Does I think you said, does it, it doesn't feel like you drove off a cliff? Because <laughs> that was, you know, that cliff dive at the end. We're like, okay, story's done. Um, <laughs> that one, Louise, in your book. Right? And so I So was then like, Th Thelma turned to Louise and- <laughs> Right? Yeah, you don't wanna, you don't wanna do that. So I was, um, I know I sent with that specific review request when people, you know, read, read the stories and then everybody, you know, you, you get like little, you know, people make little comments or like this here, or, you know, whatever, but, but nothing, I don't think major um, other than I really like, I mean, yeah. So those kind of pacing sort of things, I think that was like my, I know when I, we were working on it, that was my big concern that my pacing for novella, which is always different than a novel is different than a short story, but I hadn't, I have not, this is only the second novella I've written. So I was really, concerned about having the appropriate pacing 
So I, I, I'm going to pitch something to the three of you, just because I'm curious of how deep the knowledge of your world, your collective world is. So like in American Gods, one of the, the big plays that Neil Gaiman pushes is that the old gods aren't as powerful as they used to be because the beliefs weren't there in them. How does that relate to the supernaturals that you had in your story was the fact that they may not be the most foremost worshipped or, um, you know, did that play a factor in their power level or did you guys not even go there with this or... And if not, do you think that it could play? I mean, are you thinking this might be something you'll do again in this world or? You never know. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, think... that's an interesting idea. <laughs> that, is a, that is an interesting idea. But yeah, I, don't, I know from my story that um, she, needed, uh, she needed certain blood to, un, uh, to free her from the, 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 the supernatural character needed an acquisition to be able to free her from her her spiritual prison that she was in but uh, she's very old and very powerful and um you know whether or not you choose to exert your power in the world or just exist um and that's that's the dichotomy because there's one the the clan that laurel comes from wants to go back to where humans feared them and worked for them and they were in control and power and that has kind of faded away and they're hunted and there's this other suggestion that there's another group that is is helping the humans hunt down supernatural beings and kill them and so yeah that's but there as far as her power level goes it's uh, she's just been bound by a curse so she just needs to break the curse mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah because i mean you know you look at iceland iceland is reviving the old Norse belief. So mm. it's actually become mm. a thrust in Iceland to actually hold to the old Norse ways. And so that's why I'm kind of curious, you know, because people are exploring different avenues, different ways to have that kind of level of spirituality. Mm. Um, and I just thought, you know, maybe, you know, there's something that you guys could share about that world that maybe aren't in the books, but you guys collectively know about the world. Oh, your hand I thought it was I thought that was a cat <laughs> I, thought a, I thought a tail had made its way into <laughs> there was a fly hovering nearby so I was sort of ready to just like fly it away that's all that was about. <laughs> got it and the fly's all thanks <laughs> all right so any final words of about the book you want to share again I, i'm allowing you to not spoil it but <laughs> anything else you want to share though hmm. uh, one thing that i i was trying to do with with my my gods if you will was <clears throat> sort of bring the to i uh, like sort of a, a higher awareness that there are other gods out there other um deities right. I, I love that aside, i love that aside from that. Yeah, aside mm -hmm. from like the, the Greco-Roman gods, aside from the ones that everyone's used to to trotting right. out for a story. Mm -hmm. And so, so sort of normalizing that, you know, there is not just one level of belief in the world. You know, right. there, there are other beings, other belief systems, other, other powers out there that, right. that walk among us. No, I love that. I love that. That's exactly what I'm doing with my Mohawks book. I'm doing native stuff and native lore and native way of telling stories. So because I think that those cultures are worth putting it out there. In fact, I when I look at new media, when I'm trying to find a movie to watch or something, if I run across something that's cultural in a way that I've never been exposed to, that's like my first go-to. I, I, I want to experience what those stories are. And I think we're starting to enter an age where those are becoming the new draw for people. They, they get mm -hmm. to experience cultures from within, you know? Yes, definitely. Bravo, bravo. Negative. I didn't. Uh, so I left everything very vague in my story about even I think there's even a question of the existence. Is there an afterlife or not? And if you are a demon, what happens to you when you are when you can you die when you're killed? What happens to you if you're a demon inhabiting a human body? Do you take on the elements of that person's soul? Um, I left it all very vague and up in the air. But one thing that I definitely didn't do was set it in a uh, in a in a Christian background. Um, I'm Jewish, and I just decided 
probably a year or two ago that the default setting for a lot of stuff is, uh, you know, baseline Christianity references or whatever. And I just decided that I'm going to write stories that don't use that as the, the default. Awesome. Um, I'm working on a book right now. It's a, it's a horror novel and it also has a demon in it. And, um, you know, the default for exorcisms is like a young priest and an old priest. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, but what if you're not, what if you're not Catholic? <laughs> who, who helps then? Nobody. Um, <laughs> you're just... <laughs> You just that's it you're possessed you, <laughs> um so um so even though my story doesn't actually portray any a specific religion or faith or whatever this there's question of faith and like what does it mean overall and definitely um I wrote it from a viewpoint of not being sort of the majority um Kendrick, yeah. view mm -hmm. and uh that's something that I I don't know. I think it's important. I think it's important that not all stories are, are, I mean, obviously if that's, if that is, you know, what you're writing from, because that is who you are. Well, sure. You know, good. But mm -hmm. if that's not who you are to try to put your feelings or your viewpoint in that box for the broader view, I just, I think I'm really glad that we seem to be getting away from this is the default right you know, right no absolutely th 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 these are the things that are just you know by default if right. you don't say otherwise this is what it is and right. i love that books are not being the default anymore well um, th that and the fact that i think it's you know shows like supernatural which took judeo-christian ethics but what they did is they mm -hmm. broke all the molds so that everything was gray nobody was pure black nobody was pure white and so, you know, even if you take something that is of the norm, if you break them, because I mean, realistically, in all faiths, human beings are involved and we're fallible. So mm -hmm. doesn't say that what's put down in the book is absolutely correct. You know, somebody could have, especially through all the translations that occurred over time, mm -hmm. you lose meanings, you lose what happened from the mm -hmm. original source text. So that's fodder for authors to say, yeah, yeah, you got that part wrong. Here's how it really goes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yes. Brenda, anything? All right. So you guys ready for some get to know you questions? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> the sure. goes, oh, I got to go down. Bye. <laughs> I have to go to My the toilet. My cat needs to be fed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, this, this, I promise, I promise this is not painful. So, you know, <laughs> Brenda and Megan have gone through it. So, again, you'll do fine. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of you the same question. So, you know, just keep your answers sort of brief so we can get through the seven questions. All right. So, in this year of getting to know thyself, what habit has mattered to you the most in getting through the last year or so? Let's start with uh, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> This is the only one I don't know the answer to. <laughs> we have a superpower, um, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> yeah. um, We're like, so, okay, Megan zoned out. Like, give it to her. <laughs> <laughs> I've made active listening. I have it. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to think about uh, the habit that has mattered the most to me, and I'm trying to think of what what habits do I have or what I have I um, taken on? I think the habit of like afternoon cocktails is the, is the, only, is the new yes. habit. There you go. That, uh, <laughs> but, afternoon, morning, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it makes I mean, such beautiful it's, cocktails. It's <laughs> afternoon somewhere, but, um, right. but right, just, right, right. it's not, it is not so much the, the, uh, the drinking of the cocktail as it is the, okay, I'm going to mindfully finish what I need to be finishing today so that at this point I can stop and spend time with someone I really enjoy spending time with and sort of talking about the day and going over things. And just that rather than I'm just going to work, work, work until whatever. And it's having that afternoon break has made me really mindful about getting my stuff done so that I can enjoy some time. 
and being at home, my home body anyway, so not being able to go anywhere for a while didn't really affect me as much. But taking that time, like I'm going to finish my work and then we're going to spend some time together or I'm going to do something for myself. I'm going to read or I'm going to work on a craft or, you know, I'm going to organize a shelf or, you know, whatever, but just mindfully saying, I'm going to take this time to do something else on purpose, if that makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Fiona. Um, I think like the other 20 bajillion people in the world, I was baking a lot <laughs> during the pandemic. Ooh. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I was baking a lot and um, eating a lot too, which is, you know, my problem to deal with this year. But I yeah. baked a lot and I, I cooked a lot of really beautiful dishes. I, I love plating. I love beautiful plating. So I did that a lot last year and it's continued now because I like share my creations with my partner. I like looking at something really nice before I destroy it. And I also just love eating in general. So um, I just was like mm, breakfast, not so much, but lunch and then weekend brunches. I would make these ornate, ridiculous things, sometimes with wine, sometimes with not wine. And it's it just became a sort of like needed ritual um to like ignore what was happening in the world and to cope a little bit better and so yeah it's been a saving grace saving ritual and it's been amazing and i'm still doing it excellent i need to exercise more but I, i'm still cooking to <laughs> <laughs> go jogging too <laughs> all right and brenda oh my god habit um you know i have uh, the twins at home and so, um, and we were homeschooling and stuff like that. And the habit that I held on to was making time for my own work because it's super easy, especially when your kids are young to get so subsumed in what you're doing for them. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was our first year of homeschooling. They, um, they both are special needs kids, which adds an extra layer mm -hmm. to sorting things and trying to get them through the year intact with not being able to see my parents, not being able to see their other grandparents, not being able to see their friends, all of that stuff. But, you know, taking that time in the morning before they woke up to just do my stuff and not trying to cram my stuff in and amongst the day. Mm -hmm. um, just have, I was just having much, your time. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. my time with my, and not even talking to anybody. Cause that's the other thing. I mm -hmm. really like to have that first cup of tea without conversation. I don't yes. want you to ask me any questions. <laughs> I don't want you to talk. <laughs> Whatever you ask me, I will say yes. So you stop talking so I can just finish my tea. And then later I will deny we ever talked about it. Because I won't remember. <laughs> Having shared a room with you, I think you know, that's true. Right? <laughs> Like, let me finish this, and then we can converse. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. We do not well, speak in the morning before the caffeine. Right. All right. So what's one thing you did more of in 2020 that you enjoyed and will continue to do? Fiona? Ah, me again. Um, the thing that I, I started to do, um, and that was more so after we had an extreme, extreme lockdown where right. for about three to four months, we couldn't go anywhere. We had to stay at home. And then if you lived in a basement apartment, you were just screwed because you had no sun. Like you had, mm. you just were like a little hobbit in the cave, like, you know. And so luckily we have um, a weird Juliet balcony and lots of windows. But for those three to four months, it was, it was hard just being in the house and not being able to go anywhere and take any sun and get, mm -hmm. getting in that, that happy sun rays. And so after we were able to leave on a schedule between, you know, eight and nine, the, you know, old people can leave and then between nine and 10, you know, so I got into the habit of walking in the parks near our apartment. And so just to take advantage of that one hour where we could actually leave the house. And so after that restriction ended, I kept on doing that. And it's been nice just to see the flowers, see the change in the the air and in the foliage and in the, the, the flowers. And it's, it's very meditative and it's very nice, whether I do it by myself or with my partner. So that's one thing that I've kept on doing a little too slowly for it to be actually exercise, but I still do it. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, Megan? 
So listening to uh, Fiona and Brenda talk about their habits, I realized that some of those things, I, I also cooked a lot, not so much baking. I'm not a good baker, but I did start, I decided that I wanted to get really good at um, making Indian food because I love to eat it. And if I could make it at home, that would be wonderful. So yeah, that, lot that too. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I just decided that I really wanted to uh, up my game and learning how to cook things that I really liked to eat. Mm. And so rather than just, I, I thought I was a pretty decent cook before, you know, just tossing things together or following a recipe, but to have like sort of on hand things that I knew that I could make and going a little bit more meatless, not completely vegetarian, but finding exciting ways to eat things that didn't have meat in them. So I'm hoping to continue doing that, making, you know, really nice meals every week that I enjoy the process of cooking as much as I do the eating. If that's possible. I don't know. I nope. really, I really <laughs> like I the it. eating I part. It. Oh, and it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Does. Brenda? Totally does. So, um, I'm one of those people that as I read a magazine, especially if it's a magazine that I own, I go through and rip out the recipes that look absolutely like, oh, I gotta make this, gotta make this, gotta make this. And so you end up with like this giant ass stack of recipes. And so what I decided in the midst of not going anywhere, not doing anything, not going out to eat or whatever, that I would make one new dish a week. So the first thing I did is I went through, cause I've got this, I mean, and then I have this theory that whether or not something's worthy of a sheet protector, <laughs> if you're going to make it more than once, you yes. need to like I have it in a way. I love that you have that criteria. I love it. Right, that. right. So the, so the deal is I would take one recipe from the stack. First, I went through the stack and called stuff. I was like, oh my God, I've had this so long. I don't even know A, the magazine it came from and it's yellowed. So I'm probably not going to make this if I didn't <laughs> right, right, make it right. in the moment, right? So I called the the stack and it was down to probably about a hundred. Oh, Whoa, wow. And, wow. Right. I mean, just like this huge fat stack of magazine. Theory. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I'll just make one of these a week. And if we like it, great. It gets a sheet protector and it will go into the food rotation. Um, Cause I, 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 along with Megan and Fiona, love to eat and love to cook. And cooking is like my meditative process. You know, I go in the kitchen, I toss everybody else out. Um, and I just get in there with the fruits and vegetables and just start whacking and thinking, you know, I just, it helps me disconnect from everything else. It's a, it's really my moving meditation is making food. And so, yeah, so making one new thing a week, uh, has been a really good habit because it, I try new things. You get out of that rut of the 10 to 15 dishes that you make. Um, my other criteria for whether or not something gets a sheet protector is if three out of four of us will eat it. <laughs> because, because kids, you know, I mean, and there are some that just the two of us are, you know, like I haven't been able to convince them, although my son is, uh, has now discovered the joy of spicy food. Uh, my daughter won't, not at all. She's not, a, she's like, no, no, no. And he's like, mom, can I try this hot sauce? I said, you betcha. So we just, <laughs> you, know, you know, in moderation. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if you're ready for the scorpion sauce yet. Let's just set that one aside. Let's start with Frank's. Okay. <laughs> it's like little baby steps for hot sauce. But yeah, I'm going to continue that. Making one new thing a week or maybe more. I mean, today I, I laid four recipes out and I said to Krista, I said, pick my wife. I said, you know, pick one of these you want me to make. She goes, I have to just pick one. I'm like, no, if you want me to make all of them, I'll make all of them. But which of these looks good? And we, we had six that we sorted through. And so four of them were on the, on the rotation. But yeah, more of that, more new things. Okay. Okay. Yes. Well, what's one thing you did less of in 2020 that you realize you probably don't need anymore? Uh, let's start with Brenda. Oh my gosh, that I don't need anymore. Um, I think as surprised as I am that uh, the social stuff sometimes really uh, stepping back from that, um, I didn't miss it as much as I thought I would. You mean online uh, or in, in, in person? In, in real life and, and, and online. I mean, we, we, are, we try and institute a social sabbatical like once a week where we just like don't do any social media and put the phone aside right. and just focus with the kids and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I missed my people that I really like and I really like to see, but there's a lot of those other people that are just total energy drains that you realize it's okay. You know, you, you can keep the politeness there. But you don't have to make, you know, as we're getting ready for re-entry, I'm like, okay, 
So yeah. <laughs> what, who am I going to see? You know, and and like I always, you know, I feel like the universe is keeping Megan and I apart because she <laughs> moved to Ohio and then things happened. <laughs> Like we live only two and oh, a little bit ball. hours, right? <laughs> I'm like, what is going on with the universe? But anyway, we're gonna fix that um, in the future. Yes, and and that that kind of thing, you know, the people that you will go out of your way to make an effort to see. So more of that, you know, the people that I really want to see and get the people that I really want to see, and not the people that just take up space in your life. Excellent, mm-hmm. excellent, Megan. <sighs> I would agree with that. Um, I, like I said earlier, I'm a more of a bit of a homebody and I, I moved to Ohio. It's going to be three years in September, but the first year I just settled in the second year, couldn't go anywhere or do anything. So the having to do things thing was taken away. And, uh, um, I really, now that things are happening where should we, should we get tickets to that? Should we plan for that? I'm like, uh. <laughs> Um, but I think that the thing that I did less of in 2020 that I realized I really don't need is sort of, you know, playing nice with ideas or, or people that I don't agree with. Um, I'm not a confrontational person, but I felt like in 2020, I just, are we allowed to curse on this? Yeah, yeah. You can be a sailor and shore leave here. (laughs) I was just like, I was like, what's, what's this? Oh, my pocket is empty of all my fucks. <laughs> and um, I just, I feel like moving forward, I just want to continue to be that person that speaks out and says, <laughs> it has no fucks. you know, <laughs> yeah, I have no fucks. I, I, this, I turned 50 this year. This is my crone Ooh, age. I'm entering it. Like I am like, yes, I just, if like, it's not, things aren't there. There are things that are not okay. And I'm not going to, pretend they're okay and just sort of like you know laugh like sort of like oh that was a kind of a racist joke but okay like no I'm this is I'm gonna be like no hmm was that was that funny though or were you I'm not sure what you meant by that you know um I'm not a like I said I'm not a confrontational person and it's not that I'm gonna go out and like be you know running people down or or whatever but I just I feel like this last year just has given me the no I yeah you don't care about saving anybody else's feelings why do I need to care about saving yours exactly exactly I think mental health has been a big thing that people have focused on their own personal Mm -hmm. mental health and mental space you know I think people get away with being awful because politely we just let them right yeah Mm -hmm. Because they count on us not saying, hey, that's not okay. Mm-hmm. That's right. kind of gross what you just said or did or, right. you know. So huh? that's, that's my... <laughs> you should, you should <laughs> my moving forward. Say, oh, <laughs> that was really racist of you. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Call it out and make it make fun of it as well. At the same I just time. Realize, I just, I, I, I'm practicing this face. This is like... <laughs> This is the face. So my grandma was a wonderful, amazing woman, and she was so nice. Of course, she was my grandma, but she would make this face. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew that you, what you were doing was not okay. So this is I'm practicing. Nice. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, Fiona. I love it. I love it. Um. I think mine again was on track with the rest of the world is I just stopped watching the news and stop reading the news so much um, to save my mental health. I mean, I think there were maybe three or four times where I'd watched the news or read the news or whatever during the year that I was like really, really blazing angry or really, really like close to tears sad. And so I was like, this is not okay. This is the news. This is something I've done my part. And I can't control the rest of this. So I need to pull back. So I stopped like waking up immediately grabbing my phone and like scrolling through the news or, you know, jumping on um, the news channels here to find out what's happening. So I pull back a lot from the news. I mean, so much. And um, I found out that if, if I have to know something, my mom will let me know. Um, 
<laughs> Otherwise, the news and I are pretty much like whatever. I watch it to to practice my Spanish comprehension, but that's about it. And then to figure yeah. out when we're going to get vaccinated here. But I just feel like I feel a ton of weight has just been lifted from my brain by unplugging so much from the news. Right. Fiona, I have a friend who actually learned Spanish watching telenovelas. See you today. <laughs> <laughs> they learn all of the dramatic pauses yeah, and, right, right. and dramatic madre mia <laughs> Where there's, four, there's really? four key emotions <laughs> crying major crying ugly crying <laughs> and angry <laughs> yes angry is a big one do not forget yes, passion yes. do not forget passion ah, true, true. <laughs> well that's sometimes what anger is anyways okay so <laughs> <laughs> what makes you feel motivated, inspired, and excited? Uh, well, Megan. <laughs> well, um, working with these two fine authors really inspired and motivated me because they're Jesse. both amazing. And I would not have written this story if not for you two. So thank you. That was really, you really got a fire under me and oh, no. I got moving on it. Um, but I, I would say that other writers' successes is, inspire me and excite me and motivate mm. me. And sometimes it's because, oh, you, this book got that much acclaim? Okay. <laughs> um, but just seeing, uh, just seeing these the stories that are getting out there in the world, whether people are publishing them independently or whether traditional publishers are picking them up, and just the, uh, just a little bit like what I said before, like the default is changing, and I'm so inspired and excited to see that and be part of writing stories that that speak to just lots of different people and. Uh, I get really inspired and motivated by seeing, I guess, what other people are doing. Diana? Well, Megan basically stole my answer. Okay. <laughs> my, out of my brain. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's completely true. Like I've seen on Twitter, good old Twitter, all these amazing covers with um, cover models, illustrations, and plot lines that we have never seen five years ago or even three mm -hmm. years ago. And so um, I'm just like, wow, this story is being told. This story is getting all these retweets and getting all this exposure that's amazing. And just, mm -hmm. you know, get, that's my encouragement to keep on writing my stories, even though they may seem for me at a certain point, like really like cliche in terms of my experience. But it's like, I haven't seen that out there in the mainstream yet. Mm -hmm. But like seeing their successes, seeing these amazing covers and these amazing stories being finally like brought into this, you know, wider arena, it inspires me every day and makes me think, okay, if this story can get out there and get so much acclaim and get like these gorgeous illustrations, these covers and retweets and like, you know, exposure in general, I mean, hell, I can do it too. There you go. There you yeah. go. There you go. Brenda? My God, this is why we all worked well together. Because, <laughs> because we all what have she that. said. And this, well, yeah, because you know, that, that's what makes you keep going a lot of times. The very <laughs> first time one of my short stories was rejected when I first started, um, the rejection letter said, you know, it was really hard to pick. We had over 65 submissions. And of course, my number brain went, there were only other 65 people? Well, hell, those are great odds. Damn, I'm not competing against 6,500 other people, 65. And I'm like, fine, whatever. And it just really motivated me to like keep going. Cause I'm like, well, all right, whatever. And again, sometimes you see things and you're like, well, this is just, again, like Fiona said, I, I grew up in a time where, you know, just being yourself, you could end up dead, you know, mm -hmm. losing your job, losing your livelihood. The idea that I would get to write and tell stories uh, about all different kinds of people um, that found happiness with each other in any kind of um, situation, pairings, matches, all of that stuff is just overwhelmingly exciting. Um, and getting to talk to readers that that write you and say, you know, I feel seen. I feel seen. I, you know, when sometimes questions like, why do you write this? Because I think sometimes they worry your motive, like they want to know what your motives are and like, why are you writing this? And I'm like, I'm writing this because 
this resonates with me. These are couples that I've seen over my life and I, you know, like paying homage and tribute to their tenacity to stay together and to be, um, be what ne not necessarily the rest of society understands the extra pressures that you get from all of the different things. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that motivates me and seeing what people are doing and, and being able to be supportive to, you know, retweet those things, put them out there, say, hey, you guys look at this, this is an amazing story. Um, that's all very motivating, but yeah, but it's why the three of us work together. We're like, well, they got that. Well, shoot. Yeah. Come on, let's go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. All right. Well, what three words describe you best? Uh, Megan. <laughs> See, Fiona, Brenda, and me. Um, uh, so what three words describe me best? <sighs> Humble. <laughs> um, I'd say creative, um, open minded, and uh, awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> sure, awesome works. Okay, uh, we'll go so with that. Self content. Self content. <laughs> okay. Uh, Brenda. Oh, I, you know, it's funny because my kids and my wife and I do this game where we do this for each other, Aww. like what between, oh, that's and, you that's know, really which is, it's really fun. But, um, my, my, I said to the kids, cause my words for me are kind, tenacious and dependable. Um, because that's kind of who I am. And, um, uh, but my son said, what did he say? He goes, mom, you're loud. <laughs> <laughs> And my daughter said huggable, which I thought was really awesome. Too. Yeah, I would take that. Yeah, but it really made me laugh loud. <laughs> Fiona? Um, so when I was, yeah, I, let's see. Hmm. My initial word feels like I should be lazy because I always say this, like I'm, I'm lazy and it's pretty true. But then someone recently said, you know, you should change that to being chill. You're not lazy or chill. <laughs> there you go. But it's all in the marketing. Honestly, it's all yeah, in the marketing. It's all the marketing. <laughs> so I'm um, chill, aka lazy, distractible, and very open. I'll try anything twice. <laughs> <laughs> I love that it's more than once. <laughs> of course, you got to make sure you like. That's right. You that's right. Like no, it. no, no. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Well, what's your proudest accomplishment? Let's start with you, Fiona. Um, <clears throat> so the, the thing that I'm most proud of, um, in terms of like my, my, um, professional life anyway, is that like, when I finally finished my book and I got the agent that I was, um, looking for at that time, she Ooh. sold the book within like three months and I was just like amazed and so, so happy. You know, I didn't think it would happen that quickly. And, um, I didn't think it would happen with uh, a publisher of that size. So it's like, yay! Tons of, even like 20,000 years later, I'm still proud of that. There you go. There you go. Okay, Brenda. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. So um, last year, uh, Double Six, the book that I wrote last year um, or year before last, I got um, won a Goldie, and that was kind of really yay. special. And, um, and I was really surprised because. It's an interracial book that also features polyamory, which in the less fic world is not, and women loving women world is not necessarily one of those things that that a lot of people, um, I guess, identify with or or are comfortable with. So that was pretty that was pretty skippy. And and every uh, last year was super hard, you know, for all of us for a lot of different reasons. Um, but it was really hard last year because I, I lost my aunt oh. and that was the one phone call I wanted to make, mm. but that was probably my proudest, uh, so far, you know, I always say there's always, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen, but that was, yeah, we just meet as of, as of this recording. Yeah. As of this <laughs> Tomorrow recording. you'll conquer the world and we'll yeah. all yes. be much better. <laughs> as of this recording, <laughs> well, that was pretty skippy. All right. Awesome. Uh, Megan, did we do yours? You did not, oh, okay. um, and I've had some time to think about it. So <laughs> <laughs> I would say we're, it'll now be the topic of her new book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so speaking professionally, I would say my proudest accomplishment is just that I, that I keep doing it. I keep, if I set a goal for myself, um, I wanted to have a horror novel published and I got a horror novel published and now I'm going to hopefully have another one published, um, sell another one. Um, when I, when people ask me, oh, how many books have you written? And I say, well, written, I've written more than I've had published, but published, if you look at my backlist catalog, counting all the short stories, novellas and novels, I have something close to a hundred published things. And so I guess my proudest accomplishment is that I just keep writing things, even when I don't really think that I, sh that I'm good at it <laughs> or it's hard. Practice or, makes perfect. Um, <laughs> Even if I think that this isn't going to sell, this isn't a, a story that's going to sell, I, I write it anyway. So that's my proudest accomplishment. Yay. It's determination. Determination. Yes. All right. Well, and final question. Are happy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, final question. What's the most daring thing you've ever done? Uh, Fiona. Um, the most daring thing I ever did was um, I traveled to Thailand by myself for my um, 40 something birthday. I can't remember what year it was, 41, 42, whatever, um, for about a month. <clears throat> and I was really nervous because, you know, obviously, well, not obviously, but I don't speak the language. And of course, mm -hmm. because they don't have um, like Roman numerals, not all the uh, Roman letters. I was just like super nervous about understanding the signage, understanding um, the language, understanding even where I was going, you know, because mm -hmm. my big thing is going somewhere, jumping on the metro and, and navigating to where I need to be. And so like not being able to even just read the signs, the idea of that petrified me. <laughs> but I said, you know what? I'm 40 plus. That means tits out. Let's go. So <laughs> I just got the ticket. <laughs> and I went and I had an amazing, amazing time. Wow. There you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, Brenda. Okay. So I had to really think through the G rated version of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why, it's your episode. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I have children and they can hear. She was, so, it right. was sex on a zip line. <laughs> <laughs> So the, so the G-rated version of that is um, years ago, I went on a trip to Antigua and we went on this little like side day trip and I actually climbed up. I really Did you say side gay trip or day side, trip? Side, like a day trip. Yeah. Oh, day trip. There weren't okay. a lot of gays on that trip. It was kind of a weird, it, it was a very weird mixed group. And a lot of people got there and all they wanted to do was lay on the beach. Um, but this other guy and I were like watching these frigate birds come into the cliffs because they nest up in the cliffs. And he and I climbed, I like, I'm in sandals, my swimsuit, whatever. And we climbed to the top of this crazy ass thing, which after I climbed down, I'm like, well, that probably really wasn't well thought out, but whatever. And, and laid down on these hot rocks to look down in the cracks to see these birds nests. Now frigate birds are really huge. They're not always crazy about people looking in their nests, right? <laughs> well, yeah. And you've seen the birds, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably the most i mean you know like all i can think of is like if i fall off this fucking cliff looking at these birds there are people that are going to be really mad at me but gosh this was really cool and it, when else are you going to see a, a frigate bird baby right yeah. <laughs> it was neat and you live to tell the tale i did we there you go. To get back there you down. Go. only a little worse for the wear I, you know I, a couple scrapes here and there and um I don't have too many night terrors of the big freaking birds being really mad. We were looking at their nests. <laughs> Brenda's fights with the pterodactyls. Okay. Right? <laughs> Film at 11. Okay, Megan. Well, I realized that daring is not one of the three words I should use. <laughs> That's all I got up this morning. <laughs> um, I would say the most daring thing I've ever done is probably moving to Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> For um, some, that would be pretty high on the list. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a really it was a huge life change. I lived in Pennsylvania my whole life and uh, made some big big life changes and decided to take the chance that it would all be okay <laughs> and move to Ohio. And I did, and here I still am, and it's all okay. 
Excellent. <laughs> Better than yeah. okay. It's good. So I, I guess just the most daring thing I've ever done was just uh, take the chance that um, being being unhappy but safe was not better than taking a chance and risking maybe not being, still not being happy, but at least trying. At least you get to look at something new. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) New snowfall, something. Yeah, that's excellent. It's It's awesome. You know what? It's not people say, and how are you? And how are you settling in? How is it? I'm like, it's it's really pretty much the same here as it is there. (laughs) Same, same weather. Same. So you should have moved up with the Inuits <laughs> up in, in the northern part of the world. Then you have something new to really talk about. Yeah, this whole ice thing isn't working for me. <laughs> I think I think I would be like, no, uh, I I like a temperate. I don't yeah. want to be too hot or too cold. Mm-hmm. See, I'm not dare. I am just. <laughs> 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 the middle bear. Yeah. I don't want to be too There's cold. There's something to be said for being balanced. <laughs> That's true, Joe. There you go. All right. You guys made it through the questions. Yay! Yeah. All stars, confetti. So now okay. I have to ask. Um, people can buy this book anywhere, everywhere. Yes. Yes. Um, it'll be <laughs> wide. It'll be wide on the seventh of June. Um, it releases um, if you pre-order from Nine Star Press. You can get it on the fourth, a whole three days early, if you are burning up with desire to read this book, which you should be. Burning, um, absolutely. Burning, yes. Burning. A non-STD way. Right, right, oh, exactly. Special. Not a bad way. Yeah. <laughs> um, from Nine Star Press, so you could get that directly from the website, and they support all major forms of downloading it. So whether you have a Kindle or uh, another e-reader that needs EPUB, you can get it from Nine Star Press. Perfect. Now I'm going to ask each of you awesome. which social is the best place for people to follow you. So Fiona. Um, Instagram, I think my Insta- Instagram is more interesting. So it's <laughs> Insta, it's uh, Instagram at FionaZed.com. F-I-O-N-A-Z-E-D-D-E. Perfect. Brenda? Um, I'm probably most active um, on Facebook, which I have a writing while distracted Facebook group. Um, which I think is called the Writing While Distracted Scurry. So you can find that on Facebook or just search uh, Brenda Murphy. You'll find me. I'm on there. Easy peasy. (laughs) Megan? I post a lot of pictures on Instagram, but I am more likely to have a conversation with someone on Twitter. There you go. So if you just want to look at what I'm doing, follow me on Instagram, which is the account is read in bed. And if you want to potentially talk to me twitter is the better place and that's megan underscore heart excellent and i'll have all those links on your show page with our site cool awesome all right any final words of wisdom from any of you please buy our book yeah (laughs) please buy our book the more you buy the more we can write there you go exactly vote with your dollars yes all right, folks, this is Written on the Edge. The Rope podcast is produced by Roe Ravens Media. For our disclaimers, links to social media, our listen stations, or to sign up as a guest, visit www.ropepodcast.com. We'd like to extend a huge thank you to Fiona, Brent, and Megan for joining us. Thank you three so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Now, pick up Love, Blood, and Sanctuary from Nine Star Press, and please dive into a read that was non-Western, very inclusive, and very well tied together. We'll talk and to sexy. You all soon. <laughs> sexy. And sexy. Oh, yes. It's sexy. It's bash yeah. on. It's bash on. <laughs> and we'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Oh, what's that? Closing time. Bums rush and melody, dear.